I'm uh, really excited to talk about noise graphs as they definitely are a key components of uh, the evolution of AI and uh, advanced computing in general. Uh, due to my age, I'm going to present some sort of historical perspective uh, about the parallel evolution of knowledge graphs and reasoning, uh, the reasoning they can support. And I will develop two fundamental ideas, and unfortunately, they are very hard to read there, but uh, the first one is that data representation and computing on this data are two faces of the same coin. Uh, and uh, I'm sure you've heard about that before. And the second one is uh, from uh, Douglas uh, Hofstadter in this Gödel Scherenbach book that uh, all of you have read. Uh, it is that intelligence is all about self-reference and the ability to reason about your own reasoning. And combining these two ideas will provide an interesting compass to navigate through the history, uh, intertwined history of AI knowledge graphs from LISP uh, to business process management, the current status of knowledge graphs, and the topics I'm currently passionate about, which is causal graphs. Uh, why do I feel qualified to speak uh, and spend 10, uh, 20 minutes of your time? Uh, I have spent all my life thinking about how experts think and trying to model that. Um, we uh, start, started, I uh, was lucky to be at MIT in the late 70s and uh, learned about AI but with Marvin Minsky and uh, uh, Pat Winston. Uh, then I spent uh, uh, a little time at the French Ministry of the Sea and four years at INRIA, the French uh, National Computer Science, uh, uh, Research Center for Computer Science, where we built a, a team of 30 people developing expert system shells using uh, uh, multiple worlds, meta-level reasoning, and all sorts of interesting things in Lisp, which led me to create a private company called iLog and drive it for uh, 20 years. Uh, I iLog, we were developing uh, object-oriented constraint programming, then uh, um, optimization systems, then expert system shells, and we pivoted to business rule management, and this is the reason why uh, uh, IBM bought us in 2008. At that time, we had customers with 300,000 rules. So everybody is saying, oh, rules are uh, not very uh, powerful and all that. Uh, I'm sorry, we were doing over $200 million in rules, and we had lots of happy customers deploying very large rules systems such as USAA. Um, in IBM, I was, I was uh, finished uh, uh, VP in charge of uh, the de deployment of advanced analytics and Watson. Uh, for a few years, and three years ago, I created Causality Link for a new adventure. It's building the next generation of decision support systems for the finance world using AI and collective intelligence and causal graphs. So now you see my biases are very strong in favor of symbolic AI, and therefore powerful and readable representations. And I will get, go quickly into the two ideas that support this historical perspective. Uh, so the first one, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, very simple. It's that the data representation that you have totally impacts what type of reasoning you can do, and we just saw that with constructors. Uh, the simplest way I've found to explain that is if you have a sort algorithm, which is normally in n log of n or a little better, and you take uh, a, a bag of spaghetti before you cook them, and you cut them in a length proportional to the uh, numbers that you are supposed to sort. And then you bundle them and you whack them on the table, you sort in constant time. Right? You got that. So that shows uh, that uh, it is possible with the right data representation to have very uh, powerful uh, computation. Granted, you needed, you needed the time to cut the spaghetti. Uh, however, uh, this is what <laughs> the time you spent building very complex knowledge graphs. So that brings me to the second idea, the, the fact that intelligence is strongly linked uh, to self-reference. A goldfish, uh, or sex wasp in uh, Ofstatter's uh, book, will repeat the same movement with no memory about the previous moves, right? A dog is going to go through another door because he knows that the goal is to go outside and that the door is just a way to achieve that. And a human philosopher will marvel about his own ability to marvel about the world. No, no kidding. So that's intelligence, right? So the two ideas interlink in the fact that it is way easier to write code that reasons about data than to, than to write code that reasons about a functioning piece of code. So the more we will be able to move uh, knowledge from processing to uh, the data representation and knowledge graphs, 
uh, the better off we will be. And that's the co-evolution of knowledge graph and reasoning I will comment now. Uh, who has written Lisp in his life? Hey, this is very good. I expected way less people. So at the beginning of AI was a programming language called Lisp. Uh, it, uh, uh, it was the first language of AI, but it raised great hopes, especially because code was data. That is, you could write code that would modify your code. And therefore, there was a hope that it would be possible to imagine code that would rewrite itself as it was solving problems. That didn't pan out, in case you, you wonder. Uh, I would say the first knowledge graphs were frames, which were ones of the first constructs in Lisp to represent knowledge in graphs with complex nodes. However, the flexibility of Lisp led to its own demise. It was too easy to build very complex semantics on these frames, and very few people could understand what their programming entailed. And these geniuses were not able to convince the rest of the world that this was the path. By the way, uh, ontology editor tools like Protege are still written in Lisp, which shows the power of its self-reference capability. You know? So I will skip conceptual graphs and uh, jump to the next step, which had a much more uh, lasting uh, uh, impact, which was business process management. How many of you have implemented business process management? And that's an industrial crowd, yes. Um, it was definitely way more successful than Lisp. And it's a dedicated version uh, of knowledge graphs with very simple semantics for links and very complex nodes, right? The nodes are sub-processes that can be executed by humans or by uh, the computer. But the semantics of the links is very simply indicating the choreography of the different sub-nodes. The graph is a wonderful data representation of this high-level view of the sub-processors and how they depend on each other, the condition under which one can consider a sub-process as pro properly terminated, the condition under which another sub-process will be launched. And because we represented control logic as a knowledge graph, it was first possible to explain to human operators what was going on, so the, the explainability was, was quite there. But we could also automate very complex strategies like champion challenger, uh, understanding bottlenecks, and apply a lot of very powerful self-referencing mechanisms to the execution of the business processes themselves. And that led to their success. To me, that was quite a path in the right direction of better self-reference through the usage of knowledge graphs. So now I'll get to the current state of knowledge graphs. So that's a standard uh, representation for knowledge graph, uh, where you have uh, a, a lot of links. Uh, and uh, uh, they represent, in that case, uh, the Obama family, as well as uh, where they were born and uh, what, uh, what they were doing as a job. This type of graph is what I think we're going to talk about uh, during these two days. And they are used to perform reasoning linked to context or adjacency. And that's the examples we have seen up to this point. And we use them a lot at IBM to uh, compute the best offer in an upsell process or to generalize a question to a chatbot and many other examples that uh, we're going to see. But I want to attract your attention on two facts uh, about this, uh, this knowledge graph. The first is that while the whole graph may qualify as knowledge, quite frankly, each of the elements is more a fact than a piece of knowledge. Moreover, these facts are static. Uh, Honolulu is in Hawaii and most probably will stay in Hawaii. And it takes very extreme situations to have people that question if Barack Obama was even born in Hawaii, as a fact. So that's why it's more a fact graph than a knowledge graph. And second, the semantics of the links is very complex. They project a lot of work and complexity to the processing side, where the geographic links have to be sorted from the family links, the definition links, the hierarchy links, et cetera, that increase the complexity of the code for self-reference as in Lisp. Now compare that to the purity of the BPM semantics and how much can be achieved very clearly with a set of different knowledge graphs, each one with a single semantics and maybe more complex nodes linking the graphs together. So that's why I want to turn my attention now to my favorite version of knowledge graphs, which is the causal graphs. So, 
I have spent three years in a startup semi-stealth uh, named Causality Link, whose goal is to develop a platform which automatically extracts causal graphs from millions of financial analysis documents and news in order to build a causal model of the forces acting on the financial world. So the semantics of the, of the links of the graphs are very simple. Node A is linked to node B. If someplace in the world a human has uh, written that a, there was a causal influence between changes in node A and changes to node B, right? So people saying uh, the strength of the US dollar has decreased the price of commodities and stuff like that. And then nodes are not strings, but they are complex indicators with a location, a key performance indicator, uh, a company, a product, an industry, a date. I mean, they, they are, they are uh, decently complex objects. Uh, and these objects refer to sub-knowledge graphs, which themselves have very simple semantics, mostly I is a semantic, as was described by Denny. Now, building a model of the financial world through causal graphs automatically is quite an adventure, and we've learned a few things on the way. The first one is because this graph is built automatically, it becomes very quickly so large that reasoning on it becomes very difficult. So therefore, it's necessary to be able to establish projections of this graph on smaller dimensional planes, simplifying by aggregation. And uh, the, the Goldman Sachs uh, uh, description was uh, very clear on that. Here, we have an example of a projection where we have said we're only interested in the US and we're only interested in macro KPIs. And that generates, and we are rather happy about it, uh, we rediscover Econ 101 uh, with that. Automatically, just by reading a lot of text, 60 million text, and being able to, uh, to ask for a smart projection of the full graph. That this macroeconomic graph was generated automatically enabled us to clinch a partnership with the Toulouse School of Economics, and we have the privilege to have the Nobel Prize Jean Tirole on our advisory board. So the point is, because the representation were powerful enough, we were able to build this projection system that tremendously simplifies the subsequent reasoning on the graph and the understanding. Because with a few million nodes and links, there is no way you can understand what, uh, what is the impact of the U US initial jobless claims on the price index and stuff like that. This can, of course, be applied to understanding the dynamics of sectors or companies. So this is a projection of uh, what are the Tesla forces, what are the forces acting on Tesla. And uh, we have uh, Tesla stock price, Tesla expenses, employment, and inventory as key KPIs, key performance indicators on Tesla. And we have the forces that act on them. And you can see that there is macro forces like the stock market or uh, local forces like Tesla production downtime and many other things, right? So again, by having a projection using just the Tesla and the causal links that are uh, the Tesla KPI, the three or four uh, biggest Tesla KPI and the projection on, uh, on, uh, 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 on the causal links that are moving this thing, you get a very interesting model of what a decent analyst would how a decent analyst would describe Tesla, all coming from the wisdom of the crowds. Now that we are recognizing more than 10,000 companies, and we're on our path for the 57,000 public, uh, 57, public companies, more than 50 million documents in five different languages, an ontology of uh, over 1,000 KPIs and over 3,000 sectors and subsectors for the industry, uh, we can offer our customers a powerful way to leverage the knowledge of the thousands of authors in a few seconds. Just a few, uh, a few ideas on what can be achieved with that. Uh, multiple Hobbes query, this has been talked about, I'm not going to go. The boiling the frogs, I will let you read it if you can, but uh, I was expecting to let you read it, but I have enough time to read it. So is there an indicator? An indicator is any of these nodes, right? That has moved by more than 20% in the past and is driving up to three hops away another indicator, maybe a stock price, uh, which is linked to a company that has not moved that linked indicator by more than 5%, and that there has been no mention of the links up to this point. Well, that's called a business opportunity for a trader. All right? And so that's the type of question you can ask to a graph like that. 
All right, so to conclude, um, the more we move knowledge from processing to powerful representations such as knowledge graph, the more we'll be able to uh, have the ability of self-reference. And by the way, this constructor's idea is a brilliant idea, and that totally applies to it. I'm sure there is a possibility to reason about constructors that is way simpler than uh, reasoning about the sub-RDF graph that represents, uh, was trying to represent it. The second one is that we truly cannot uh, go the list path that is uh, splurge in the variety of semantics of the links because every time that you add more complexity into the links, you add more complexity into your, or you, you remove the, your long-term ability to do self-referencing. Finally, I hope that uh, I've teased your interest in causal graphs. And I'm at your disposal. I'm going to say this two days. <laughs> Thank you, Pierre. We have time for two questions, and uh, I'm going to give Danny the first. Thank you. Great work. Um, my question is, how do you ensure that you don't mix up causality and correlation? OK, so data is blind to causality, you know that? And so, but humans are really good at that. So what we do is we only take statements by people in texts and usually people, when they are making those statements in text, try to be smart because they have a vested interest in it. So we kind of apply the wisdom of the crowds. Now, we, uh, we take um, opposite, we, we have a way to combine opposite directions or to detect opposite directions of opinions. So in general, I apply the wisdom of the crowds and the human brains to causality versus uh, correlation. One more question. Hi, um, what are some open research questions in building causal graphs? <laughs> no, that, let's take that on the side. This is huge. <laughs> no, really, it's a, I think the reasoning on causal graph, uh, we really are uh, at the beginning. Of course, the question, uh, what happens when you have a correlation that everybody believes is a causality? Well, in fact, it's correlation. This is uh, then uh, all the, the books on the books of why and uh, you know, the, the confounders and all the fantastic te uh, mathematical technologies that are underneath. I have a PhD in uh, Bayesian inference, and he will, he's unstoppable on that. So uh, I will try to put you in touch with him if you want. Thank you. Thank you.